Good evening and welcome to Copperfields Books virtual event with Shalina Ayana. My name is Jamie and I'll be your host for the evening. So just a couple of things before we get started. Go ahead and keep an eye on your chat box tonight. I'll be sharing links to buy tonight's title, discount codes, uh, links for more information about Shalina and the like. And for any questions or comments that you have for tonight's author, go ahead and submit under the Q&A icon, which is right at the bottom of the screen, so we can easily see them. And now I'm really excited to introduce tonight's author. Shalina Ayana is the founder of Rising Woman, a growing community of more than 3 million readers. Her training and immersion in couples facilitation, inherited family trauma, family systems, conscious relationships, somatic healing, and plant medicines inform her holistic approach to seeing relationship as a spiritual path. More than 30,000 women in 146 countries have taken her flagship program, Becoming the One. And in her new book, Shalina takes you on a transformational inner work journey to heal lifelong relationship patterns and reclaim power over your life. As I mentioned, her and her husband, Ben, live in Salt Spring Island, British Columbia. Not even going to try and pronounce the way what it used to be called. Um, so she is with us tonight to discuss her new book, Becoming the One, Heal Your Past, Transform Your Relationship Patterns, and Come Home to Yourself. And first off, congratulations on your debut. This book is such a gift. I truly found so much comfort in the pages. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to you and have you get us started and um, really appreciate the writing on this one. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a real gift to have the opportunity to share this book with so many beautiful hearts around the world. Uh, so today I'm going to do a little talk about the book and what it means to become the one. And then I'm going to open up for questions and we'll just engage a little bit in some conversation. So this is the book. It's called Becoming the One. Uh, for those of you who have yet to follow my work or read anything from me in, in the past, primarily I write about conscious relationship. And when we think about conscious relationship, many of us, we relate the idea of relationship in general to being with another. And while that is definitely one of the key features of relationship, the foundation of all of our relationships is the relationship that we have to self. And culturally, we're really programmed to seek externally, to grasp externally, to look for somebody else to make us feel whole, to take away feelings that we're uncomfortable with, or to complete us in some way. And that really puts us in a position of lack of awareness and this feeling of being broken or not enough. So becoming the one, the reason that I wrote this book was to create a roadmap for rebuilding a relationship to self, really tuning back into what it means to build that foundation within, to have a deep connection to yourself rooted in awareness of your personal history and what your inner child needs and what wounds might be present for you and what your relationship patterns are trying to tell you. Now, a lot of times we don't even realize we have a relationship pattern, right? We, we tend to cycle through relationship as though it's all fate. And so we meet a person and we feel, you know, these hot and heavy honeymoon hormones and we get really passionate and we fall, you know, in love, we fall in love. And we often fall into relationship rather than consciously choosing it. And what inevitably happens is that somewhere along the way, we reveal ourselves, right? All of that masking that's going on and that putting on the perfect face while we're in early relationship sort of fades away as we get more intimate with a person. And this is usually where we hit that point of hitting a conflict phase or the power struggle phase. And this gets really challenging because we start to feel like maybe the love is gone or there's something wrong with the relationship. And so we'll end the relationship and then we'll just move on to the next person. And often we'll cycle through these stages over and over and over again. 
And what we won't realize is that we're actually in a pattern and we're bringing people in that trigger those old wounds, often from childhood or our family conditioning, and yet we're not actually getting anywhere. And so eventually we hit a point where we really do want to change the pattern. We start to recognize that we have a role to play in our relationships and how they look. And we begin to take our power back by taking ownership over the role we're playing. And a big piece of that is looking at the ways that we perhaps fall into relationship rather than consciously choosing it because we haven't taken the time to know ourselves on a deep level or perhaps that we have numbed out some of the pain that has yet to been processed or we are still carrying old beliefs about not being enough or not being worthy or we have blocks around trusting love and in in the pages of this book I share a lot of intimate stories from my own childhood not because I wanted to write a book all about myself but because so many of us come from painful histories where we were emotionally uncared for or there was neglect or there was abuse or there was dysfunction and that became our reality and in those early stages are the conditioning that we receive about love so we look at our first family and then we look at media we look at the movies that we watched and the tv shows that we watched and then we look at what we learned from the other authority figures in our lives at school and wherever else we were in, in whatever environments we were in. And that's our template for love until we reach a point of inner maturity where we can re-educate ourselves on what it means to be in relationship. And so there is really this journey unfolding in this book and in all of my work that's centered around taking yourself through the stages of healing, of reconnecting to your body, tapping into not just what your mind thinks and what your head thinks, but also what your heart and your body is telling you, and relearning how to trust your inner compass. One of the things that I talk about a lot in this book is that failing in relationship is a perception. All of our relationships are teachers. There's always something to learn from the people that come into our lives and the people that we cross paths with. And so we come to these crossroads when we end a relationship and we can either use that evidence that there's something wrong with us or there's something wrong with them or that love just doesn't work out for us or that we just can't trust people or we can allow, and, and that's bitterness, right? We go into bitterness. Or we can allow our relationships to be our teachers and to inform us where there is a wound left unattended, what might be left to be felt. And we can allow that information to guide us deeper into our own healing work. And so when I talk about letting relationships be teachers and having responsibility for our patterns, what I'm not saying is that makes you wholly responsible for other people's actions or other people's behaviors. It does make you wholly responsible for your role and how you show up. And so we're not talking about never attracting somebody again who isn't aligned for us because we're always going to attract all sorts of people. What we wanna check in with is who do we say yes to? Where are the red flags that we ignore? And more than that, what do green flags look like? What does a healthy, secure relationship look and feel like? Have we ever experienced that before? What does it take to rebuild that template within ourselves? And so that is one of the pieces of, of this book and one of the chapters that is red flags, green flags. We talk a little bit about false alarms. And a false alarm is when we have been in a state of tumultuous relationships, we've maybe experienced chaos in our history, or we've experienced a cycle of betrayals or not feeling heard or not feeling seen in our earlier years. 
And so we have created that template of people in our lives in relationship. And so this is, this is what we call a projection. I have a whole chapter on understanding and decoding our projections because they really get in the way when we're in romantic relationship, our tendency will be to assume the worst based on what we know from our history. And so it's very hard to decipher between an actual red flag or a false alarm if we are A, not in our bodies, and B, if we are projecting onto the person because we are assuming that they have the same intentions that the people in the past did when we were hurt that initial time. So where we go back to our original wound. And so what does it mean to be in our bodies and to trust? Many of us might say, well, you know, I've had all of these relationships that didn't go well, so I can't trust myself. And the truth is, is that most of the time, if we really look back in our histories, there were times where we felt like something was off or we had an alert, we had a red flag, but then we dismissed it. Or perhaps we felt it for a moment and then it didn't come back because we've learned how to tune out our bodies or we went into our heads, it didn't make sense, so therefore we invalidated it. So I like to invite everyone who has this idea that maybe they're a failure because their relationships have ended in the past to reframe that and to see that every time that you have opened your heart again and made an attempt at love, that was a sign of your willingness to try again. And that takes so much courage. And that's a gift. And so my, my prayer for everyone who reads this book is that they meet new parts of themselves in these pages, that they discover something new about their own values and their own emotional needs, that they meet their own tenderness in a new way, and that perhaps they are able to expand their expression. And what I mean by that is, is expanding our expression to embody all of the elements, fire, air, earth, water. And so in, in chapter three, coming home to the body's wisdom, I have a, an outline of the elements and what emotions they represent. And so often we embody one or two of the elements very strongly. We lean heavily on those. For example, some of us embody a lot of fire. And so our, our default emotion is anger because that's protecting us. But underneath that would be our water, which is the sadness and the tenderness and the vulnerability. And so in order to integrate, we want to welcome all of the expressions and all of the elements and allow ourselves to experience them all at different times, rather than only defaulting to one state. And so I call that the emotional elements of integration, because there's always a way for us to open ourselves deeper into expression and relationship is the perfect way to practice that. And yet, if we don't allow ourselves to be authentically fully expressed, we'll find that our relationships can only go so deep. Because we can only go as deep with another as we can go with ourselves. So if we're not honest with ourselves about who we are and what we really want, if we can't own our sensitivity, if we can't acknowledge when our feelings are hurt, if we can't ask for what we want, if we don't know what we want, then how will we be able to express that to another? Right? And so all of that is within the pages of this book. We take you through different exercises to tap into that and then to tap into core values. So I'm going to go back to the beginning when I talked about the difference between falling into relationship and choosing it consciously. What does that really mean? One of the processes that I take you through in, in my core values chapter is to look at what values you were drawn to when you were in relationship in the past, what your current values are, seeing where the misalignments were perhaps, or seeing if you perhaps relied too heavily on certain values and dismissed others. And then taking all of that information and allowing it to guide you in your relationships, not just romantically, but at work and with your friends and with your family, so that you know what kinds of relationships feel aligned for you and what brings you alive 
based on that alignment of what you value the most and being able to express that. And it's not about having somebody who has all the same values and is exactly the same as you, but there does need to be enough alignment that you two actually could have a path together or that there's a friendship that's possible here and that you know that it's a safe, loving connection. So a lot of times we will jump into relationship without asking questions, without qualifying, without saying, you know, hey, this is, this is what I value. I value authenticity. I value deep communication. I value honesty. You know, I value spiritual growth, whatever it is. How do you feel about that? And what does relationship mean to you? What do you think a committed relationship looks like? What's your relationship to conflict? Do you feel like conflict is bad or that it should never happen, right? Or, you know, are you willing to sit in the fire when things get hot? And, uh, and, and there's tools, you know, in this book as well around somatic practices to be able to learn how to navigate that intensity when it arises and how to know what it looks like to navigate conflict and communication and set boundaries in a way that is healthy and self-loving so that we can be in ourselves and we can be with another. And that is the difference between conventional relationship wisdom, which says, there's another half of me out there and I'm looking for my soulmate or my twin flame or this person who's going to come and complete me versus I am already whole. I am the one and I'm a whole person looking to share a life with a whole person and then we can walk this path together. And when we choose that, when we really choose that and when we, we embody wholeness, when we radiate confidence and, and true self-love, and we will be able to resonate with a person who is also in their wholeness. And I call this mature love, right? This is mature love that we're choosing from a place of wholeness rather than a place of woundedness or urgency or grasping for another to save us. Because no matter what, no matter where we go, no matter where we find ourselves, no matter who we're with, our stuff is going to come up in relationship. That is what it's designed for. There is no more intense vehicle for spiritual growth in relationship. And so it's not so much about finding the perfect partner, but having yourself so that you can choose a partner who you really just deeply want to share the journey with, but also knowing that you're okay on your own. And that's a real skill and a, and a gift that we can build within ourselves to learn how to be alone and to build intimate friendships and to build community so that we don't go into this independent bubble of just having a partner and expecting that person to meet every single need of ours and not investing in knowing ourselves and deepening in our own relationship to self and deepening in our friendships because we need that community. We need those friendships to nourish us as well. And in, in this book, I, I actually don't know what page it's on, but I think it's in the emotional uh, integration chapter, but there is a, you'll see a little graphic. It's a little circle and there's this relationship to self, other spirit, nature. So I talk about how conscious relationship, it's not just your relationship to yourself. It's not just your relationship to other. It's also about your relationship to nature and your relationship to spirit. And so how do we build that circular connection where there's reciprocity and where we can draw on power and safety and security in the elements where we can seek healing in nature, where we can learn how to soothe ourselves with the elements of the earth to find grounding when maybe things feel uncertain. Or perhaps when our human family doesn't have the capacity to hold us through or to love us the way that we want it to be loved or to meet us in the ways that we want to be met. And in my chapter on divine mother and father energy, 
I take you through a process of understanding your own conditioning with your first family, maybe anything that you learned from them about love that needs to be released. But then also recognizing that our parents are just human beings. And there is a difference between the human and the archetype that we hold on to so strongly of mother and father. The mother-father archetype is the one that should have done X, Y, Z, that should have given us all of these things, but didn't. And that's absolutely valid because we all as small children deserve that. But if we didn't get that, then our work in our healing is to essentially release them from that archetype and just see the human and then find that connection to our own inner mother and inner father and mature ourselves into wholeness through the elements, through self-soothing, through inner child work and finding our way back to ourselves. Uh, so that is in essence, the book. Um, there's a lot more, obviously, that I could share. There's so many different pathways that we could go down. But typically, when I do these talks, I really love to hear if anybody has questions before I finish. So I'm going to take a little pause now. I'm going to take a drink. And then I'm just going to see if there's anybody who has a question. And we'll give a few minutes for that. And if nobody has a question, then I will pick back up and we'll start chatting again. So I'll just give you a moment. You can uh, enter your question in the Q&A box. Um, or if you don't know how to do that, you could do the chat as well. What have been some personal practices that you have done on a regular basis to nurture yourself? Okay. Well, actually, I'm just looking through um, this, the, the book, uh, to see if I could share a few practices with you. So that's really in line. For me, personally, one of the things that I have always found great comfort in is being in nature. And I really integrate that a lot in the book because I feel that it is something that is innate in all of us that maybe we've felt some disconnection from, but that's very ancient. Um, there's so much nurturing that happens when we go into nature, when we walk through the forest, when we dip our toes in a river, when we wash our face in a, in a clear Creek, um, you know, when we're hiking and even sitting by a fire and just looking at the fire. And so I've really found a lot of comfort in that and sharing practices that allow us to tap back into that. Because when we get really quiet and we go into nature, often a lot of wisdom, innate wisdom in our bodies can be heard. So sometimes we just actually need to get quiet. And another aspect of doing more somatic work is a body scan. And this is something that I suggest that we all do especially when we're getting to know ourselves on a deeper level is taking a few minutes to tune in throughout the day and do a body scan. So I'll tell you how to do that now. Essentially you're, you know, going about your day, maybe you're washing your dishes or you're running errands and then you get home and you just take a moment to breathe and take a pause before you start getting back to your busyness and just scan through from head to toe and feel the sensations in your body. Notice your breath, if it's shallow, if it's heavy. And there's nothing to do, just noticing. Oh, I'm in my body. I'm feeling this, I'm feeling that. Oh, 
I have to pee. I've been holding on to my pee for two hours because I wasn't in my body, right? And it sounds so silly and so simple, but we do that, right? We don't listen to our body's cues. We sort of live in our heads a lot. And so coming back to the body and just checking in every so often, taking little breaks to pause and be in the body and and ask, what do I need right now? Do I need to drink a cup of water, right? Do I need to just go put my feet on the ground for a few minutes? You know, do I need a break? What do I need? And that practice will actually help us a lot when we enter into relationship because we need to be able to tune into our bodies and know when we're hitting a threshold where we're feeling activated so that we can respond maturely rather than react defensively. And the, the only way to be able to do that, to have that willpower and self-control is to be in our bodies and connected to our needs. So I recommend that practice um, for anybody who wants to get started. Let's see. Okay, so I have another great question, which is how do you respond to a partner who doesn't think they have any work to do? Okay, well, if they don't think they have any work to do, then they're not going to do any work. And so you can just accept that. That's all you can do. Um, I know it's a tendency for all of us to want to change our partner or to fix them or to wake them up. And of course we do this because we love them or we want energy from them. And yet we can't wake another person up. And it's very important that we recognize this, that people wake up in accordance to their own path on their own timeline, and we cannot change it no matter what we try to do. So you might see all of the ways that they are acting out from their inner child wounding or all of the ways that they could heal or show up differently, but unless they feel an inspiration and a call within themselves, they're not going to do that work. And they might pretend to do the work or try to do the work for you, but it won't be authentic until they're doing it for them. And so this is why in the book, I I talk about this a lot, actually, but I also do have a process for looking at your core values, looking at your boundaries, and then creating a love map in the end where you really get clear on what kind of relationship you need to feel alive and energized without having perfection as a goal, because that doesn't exist. Um, Because sometimes we can continue on the path with this partner and we can just let them do their thing and we can continue to deepen in ourselves and deepen in the work and that relationship can still grow and be beautiful not everybody has to be doing the exact same work as us but other times there might be some very fundamental issues in the way or red flags or things that just simply don't work for us and very much misalign with our values But the only way for us to know is for us to be embodied fully in our own truth and in the work. And then it all becomes clear. And that's often the part that we miss. We get into relationship and we so often we focus very externally on wanting to fix and change them without embodying the work ourselves, without embodying the communication practices or the heart centeredness or the vulnerability or the honesty or the ownership. And so we have to start with ourselves. And so I I really emphasize that. So once you've done that, you can be certain, you know, whether or not this person is aligned for you. But it can be tough, right? When we're in relationship, if we have a partner who's very unwilling to look at their, their behavior or look at their minds at all, then we have to ask ourselves, what am I willing to accept? You know, and are these things that I'm struggling with in this relationship deal breakers for me, or are there things that I can accept in this? And does this resonate, you know, with my values and, and my worth, right? Am I self-abandoning to be in this relationship or can I still honor myself and be in this relationship? Great. Okay, anybody else? Hi. Hi. Well, I have a couple questions. And um, for all of you, I didn't show you, but I read this book and I've probably dog-eared half the book. And 
it's, I just really appreciate the way it's, you almost like hold our hand while we go through it. And it's great because it's not daunting in the sense of, yes, there are exercises, but while you're reading it, you're almost subconsciously thinking she's like planting it in your mind so that when you get to it, you know, one thing that I really enjoyed was the um, emotional, when you have the emotional intensity and kind of asking yourself, um, you know, what am I feeling? And it just remind me of something. I thought that was very, very valuable. Um, but I guess you've kind of touched on this, but what, what do you want each person to take from this? I feel like everybody's going to take something slightly unique to their own history and story. But ultimately, what I want everyone to take home is that they are whole and that they are lovable. And that whatever they've experienced in their history doesn't make them broken. It just makes them beautiful human beings with experience. Um, I also want people to come from this seeing that they actually have the power to transform their patterns and to experience deep, fulfilling, safe love, no matter how many times they've tried, no matter how many relationships have ended, no matter if they're 25 or 75. And, you know, I do, I actually have a story um, from a 73 year old psychotherapist who went through my program in this book, because it's just so beautiful to see that at any age, there can be growth and healing. And sometimes we assume that, you know, at a certain age, it just stops. Um, and so I really loved including that story in this book because it's such a good reminder, you know, it's never too late. Uh, to try again and to open our hearts. You were very candid through this book and I, I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not always easy. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun to share some of the stories like Ben, Ben, my husband and I, because you remember probably the, it's not about the Nespresso story. Oh, I remember that. I laughed at that story. It was poignantly familiar in ways. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're eventually going to do a podcast. He's like, let's do a podcast and talk about that story because obviously we're the only ones who could really tell it. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's just, it was fun for me to, you know, really be vulnerable and honest about some of the ways that I've shown up in relationships so that I feel like other people have an invitation to get really honest with themselves rather than feeling like, oh, this person has it all figured out and they're perfect. I wanted to really be honest so that people could be like, oh, right. Like we're all human and we all have these things and it's okay. So if you can take a minute and just tell us a little bit about your rising woman program, how did you even end up here? Like, how did I end up creating? Rising yes. Women's like Women's what led Women's to Women's. creating this program? And I mean, of course this book is, is from, is one of the self-discovery programs. So I'm just curious how that all came about. Yeah. I mean, well, I started, I started writing, um, and building rising woman sort of as like this little seed really early on, like 2013, I bought the domain on a payment plan and, um, I just started writing and sharing and at, at the time I was writing on Facebook and then eventually I went over to Instagram in like 2018 and I was writing almost every day and it really just caught on fire you know millions of people began following my writing which was so mind-blowing and I wrote the program becoming the one because most often I end up working with people who are familiar with love chasing patterns or anxious avoidant patterns where there is some unavailable love or there's this lack of clarity or there's these highs and lows. Um, and I wanted to really take people through the journey that I had to guide myself through, which was, <laughs> my dog's gonna bark, um, which was really about finding wholeness within myself and and remembering that I was okay on my own because so often when we're in these anxious dynamics or when we're chasing love we've lost that connection to ourselves so I I created this program based on what I took myself through when I was really at rock bottom 
So many of the processes that I designed to help you get to know yourself and to understand yourself. And then of course, to map out what you want your relationships to look like. I did that for myself, you know, alone in my bedroom or in the garden. And so it just felt like a deeply personal and, and healing experience to after many years of having integrated that work to finally turn it into a program. And then it it really caught fire. There's like over 30,000 women, I believe, who have taken Becoming the One. And so when my publishers all reached out and invited me to write a book, it made sense for me to start there, to start with Becoming the One and and, healing your past and transforming your patterns and coming home to yourself, because that's the essence of my story. And that's the, that's my work encapsulated. Uh, Well, kind of along those lines, I know this is your debut, but can you tell us a little bit about the writing process? Absolutely. I'm just going to bring this little guy onto my lap. Yeah, bring him. A little worked up today. And if you guys have other, you know, personal questions or things you want to touch on, please feel free to continue submitting them. Yeah, so the writing process was interesting. It um, it didn't start out easy, which is interesting because I wrote every single day. I mean, if you look at my Instagram, I've written over a thousand pieces and you calculate all of that word counts, like four books, right? And so I didn't realize how confronted I would be at first when I got the book deal. Um, because I've wanted to be an author my whole life. Like I've always wanted to write a book since I was like four years old. I've been writing. I had teachers tell me when I was in elementary school that I was going to be an author. Like it was always the thing for me. And so when I finally had this big dream in front of me, a lot of stuff came up, a lot of fear, a lot of self-doubt. And I was quite honestly surprised by it. It was so deep in me. I, I didn't actually know that that was there because I hadn't gone outside of my comfort zone and done the thing yet so for a while I flailed pretty hard actually and then I remember my husband and I we I had this deep feeling that I needed to go to Hawaii to write the book and so we did it was in the winter and we we went and the like the second day that I got there I went and sat down on the couch and I had been trying to write and it wasn't going well And before I could even get any words out, I just broke down in tears and I was just crying. And I was just like, I'm not a writer. I'm not, I can't do this. I'm just going to give my advance back and quit. Like I'm just done. And normally he would really challenge me and be like, you know, he would say all the things and he would kind of bring solar energy to me, but he just knew he saw that I was really in a deep place and he was just like, okay, well, you know, if that's what you need to do, like we can do that, you know? Um, and then I cried and then he held space for me to do some breath work. And then the next day I started writing and I wrote the whole first manuscript in four months. Wow. Um, so it was like, there was a big hurdle to jump over and write when I was willing to quit. And I had that permission And then I remembered all of the people who I was writing for and my whole team and all of the publishers and everyone who had put energy into it. And that actually really kept me going because I, I had not just myself to let down, but I had all of these people who had given so much energy to me. And so that really carried me through. So self-publishing would never have worked for me because I would have been like, oh, it's fine. I just won't do it, you know? Um, And then, yeah, and then writing it was really beautiful. I made deep friendships with my editor um, and, you know, we went through so many layers of editing and eventually you get to just infuse essence and make it perfect. And it was really fun. That's so great to hear. And I know you probably can't talk much about it, but can we expect anything from you in the near future? Yeah, I won't say what yet, but definitely uh, in 2023, we'll be having something new. And um, I do have another book that I'm really excited about that I can't say when that will be out. But um, yes, I, I feel like this book was such an opening for me. And I, by the end of it, you know, first I hated it. And then I, by the end of it, I loved it. And actually the night that I submitted uh, my manuscript, I, I wrote the outline for my next book that, you know, probably is years away. 
many years away, but in me nonetheless. <laughs> Look at you, you're a pro after one book. Oh yeah, <laughs> professional. <laughs> We have a question here from um, one of our attendees. Would you be willing to expand upon your experiences with plant medicine and how that contributed to your path and growth? Yeah, great question. Yeah. yeah, so I'll share with the caveat that, of course, I'm not ever recommending you just go off and do plant medicine unless it's really deeply calling you and you feel really safe and you trust your guide. Um, obviously, plant medicines can be an, an enormous gift. They can hold so much healing and potency. And yet if we're not ready, or if we don't have someone to help us with integration, they can take us too far too deep in a way that is actually harmful. So I just really want to emphasize that because being curious about something is different than being deeply called towards something. And I'm curious about a lot of things that I'll never try because it's the, the medicine isn't calling me per se. So I, I just want to emphasize, cause you know, I talk about my work with ayahuasca a little bit in this book. And for me, it was extremely hard and it's, it was terrifying to be quite honest. And yet I wouldn't take it back because I had some of the most important teachings come through for me when I was in that medicine space around actually the, the teaching that I share in the book around divine mother, father energy, I share a whole story about how that actually came through in a ceremony for me. Um, so yeah, if you feel the call, it can be a beautiful path, but it requires so much discipline and so much integrity to do it safely. Um, and I think now is a really cool time because we see like there's the MAPS Foundation where they're really working on different therapies with different plant medicines and psychedelics. And there's a lot of really cool documentaries out there, like Fantastic Fungi, which is all about um, healing with mushrooms. Like there's really cool stuff out there now where you can see healing happen with these plants. Um, so I'm all for it. I just think that there's also other ways to go about it. And for me now, like I worked with psychedelics and plant medicines for many years and a lot, like I did a lot of different ceremony. And now I'm sort of in this place where I'm so sensitive and I've opened myself so much that it's all about subtle energy now. So for me, I don't really work with, I don't work with psychedelics anymore. I actually, I'm, I'm working with homeopathics now which are still extremely powerful, but there it's the essence of the plant. And I find that to be quite beautiful as well. So really for me, it's also about being mindful of what we're looking for. Are we looking for this big grand experience with a story to tell, or are we, are we really just looking for healing and, you know, can we allow ourselves to take the gentle path? You know, sometimes we really, we want to go to the extreme because we think we need to push ourselves. But I think it's important to ask yourself, like, does my body and my heart and my spirit really want that? Or do I actually need gentleness? So really checking in there. I'm muted. Sorry. We have kind of a follow-up here asking if you can talk more about homeopathic. This, uh, she's new to it. Yeah, I'm new to it as well. So I'm no expert. Um, actually, Dr. Aviva Ram is a wonderful person to learn from on homeopathics. And she has lots of books out um, that I'm personally studying. And I have a wonderful homeopath here on the island that I've been working with. Um, so I would say just pick up a book from Dr. Aviva Ram. But in essence, the homeopathic is like the it's the energy of the plant. It's more the spirit you know, whereas in herbalism, we have like the whole plant. So we have like the material body and the spiritual body. And so when you take homeopathics, my, my homeopath always says to me, less is more. So you actually take a very, very, very small amount, and then it helps your body like bring, come into balance. And I've actually found tremendous healing from it. Um, just even with like feeling imbalances in my body, not, not so much emotional. I haven't done that work with homeopathics yet though you, you can absolutely, a lot of them are used for that. But even for me, it's just, 
you know, if I have heartburn or if I have a headache, my homeopath has given me these little um, medicines to take. And my husband and I are on some right now for allergy season and so far so good. So yeah, it's really beautiful. Wow. That's really interesting. Did, what was the doctor you said? Dr. Aviva Ram. Aviva Ram. I will be sure to include that name in the follow-up email tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Eva. Yeah, she's wonderful and has some amazing books. And um, she's also on Instagram too, if you're an Instagrammer. And we've received so many thank yous. I just want to let you know. Um, and people are, you know, your work is extremely inspiring and helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah, you know, you are so cute and I love your energy. <laughs> your kindness and peace shines through. Thank you for writing this book and hosting this call. So we've got a lot of excited people. You, is there anything that we haven't touched on that you want us to know about before we kind of dive into the book? Well, I've already read it, but for all of you out there interested. Yeah, just just knowing that however you choose to go through this journey is perfect for you to take it at a pace that feels right for you. Um, somebody asked me the other day, like, what's the best way to read the book? Like, should we do all of the exercises while we're reading it? You know, what what is the best way to get something out of it? And I think there's two types of people. There's the kind of person who just reads a whole book in like two days or a week. I'm that kind of person and I don't do the exercises live. I come back to them later. Or there's the person like my mother-in-law who's reading the book right now and she's going so slowly and methodically. She's doing all of the exercises and we're just different. And so I say, just, you know, do this the way that you want to do this. Um, and, and at least try some of the practices though, like some of the meditations and the body scans. Um, and the self-soothe, you have a soothing process in there, which is incredible. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of that one. And I find that's so needed for all of us, you know, learning how to self-soothe. Yeah. And this book is such a tool. You're right. It's, it's so, in, it has so much rich information, but it's also so practical that it's, it's a winner, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, I know we spoke about it already, but maybe next, whenever in 2023, when your book <laughs> comes out, I would love to be able to host you in person. We can all get a chance to meet you and get our book signed. That'd be great. Yeah. But thank you for being with us to all of you watching. Yes, this is being recorded. Everyone will receive an email tomorrow with the link to the recording, all the details about tonight's title and where you can find more information, where you can read more about rising woman, all the goodies. So on that note, I really, really want to thank you again, Shalina. I, this has been such an incredible hour. Thanks so much for having me. It was a pleasure. And I hope you all have a beautiful evening. Good night. Bye-bye.